Of course, we live in the age of space exploration. We remember when man first stepped onto the moon, no less. It's still very exciting for little children to have a real-life astronaut come to school to visit them and speak about the extraordinary things that can happen when you're up there in a rocket. The questions were endless when the lively young pupils at Bangkok's Harrow International School had the rare opportunity to meet an astronaut, Nicholas Patrick, himself an old Harrovian from London and now a NASA mission specialist in the United States. Children this age ask such fantastic questions, ranging from uh, the everyday, how do you get dressed, how do you go to the bathroom in space, to uh, quite frankly the esoteric, how do you spot a black hole, are there aliens, have you seen any? But they have a good point. What about aliens? What's your feeling there? Well, I'm, I'm sure we've never been visited. I think if we'd all, if we'd been visited, we'd, we'd know about it. Um, uh, but it's a very large universe. There are many galaxies, each with billions of stars, and many of those stars probably have planets around them. So who knows what's out there for us to discover in the future? You've made a career finding out more about this. Did that desire start very early in your life? It did. I, I've wanted to be an astronaut since I was five years old and saw the Apollo 11 moon landing. And uh, it's a dream I've pursued um, avidly ever since then. And what's the first step for those who have that dream? I think the first step is one that's actually not necessarily obvious to children, is that you've got to study really hard and uh, be a very good student. Uh, because unless you go all the way through your schooling and go on to university and graduate school, it's very hard to be competitive um, to be an astronaut. Yes. Now, you're from England, aren't you? Yes. I think most people can tell from your accent, we would say, <laughs> that you're not American, but the program is very much an American one. You're at NASA, so that's another big step. It is. Well, I actually uh, moved to America after I left Cambridge uh, in 1986. I moved to America, I got a job with an aerospace company, and I eventually became a U.S. citizen, which is how I was able to join NASA as a U.S. astronaut. So the space race that we used to hear about, does that no longer apply? That's very much a thing of the past. We work hand in hand with the Russians to build, maintain and operate the space station, the International Space Station. Um, uh, uh, almost half of that is uh, Russian, uh, about half of it is American, and the remainder is uh, European and Japanese. So we're a very uh, multicultural uh, organization and we're not competing, we're cooperating in space. So that implies that the world generally finds this, this program of, of um interpreting space and, and going there and finding what's there to be truly worthwhile. I think so. It's, it's valuable on a number of fronts. It's a wonderful place to foster international cooperation, as you can see from the construction of the space station. It's a great place for us to learn uh, how to put people in orbit and keep them there safely for long periods, which is something we'll need to be able to do if we want to go back to the moon or onto Mars. Is it a good place to live, though? It's a very challenging place to live, but I have to say, yes, it's a wonderful place to live. Uh, the experience of floating around inside your home is something you can't get here on Earth, and, and that's, that's fun. But the very best bit is the perspective it gives you on the planet. The views are beautiful, they're constantly changing as you travel around the planet at 8 kilometers a second. And, you know, you see 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets a day on the space shuttle, on the space station, if you have time to watch them. What can you see from space? Because rumors abound, as you know. Yes. The Great Wall of China, for example. Can it or can it not be seen? Well, with the naked eye, yeah. you cannot see the Great Wall of China. Uh -huh. um, with a good telescopic lens, you can see many man-made features. Mm -hmm. uh, at night, you can see cities, uh, roads. 
you can see fishing ships which are brightly lit. Um, you can see all sorts of things that are well lit. But in the daytime, really the only evidence of humanity on the Earth that you see are the changes in color from one region to the, to the next, from rural to urban. The colors change from green to gray. And um, you'll see forestry boundaries, and sometimes the boundaries between countries that have different forestry policies, for example. You know, we see uh, photographic material that comes back from space stations. Everyone looks so homely, really getting around in their shirt sleeves and doing something, having a bit of fun usually yes. too. But there's something important going on. There's a lot that's important going on, yes. isn't there? A, a lot of things. We're learning how to live in space for long periods. We're learning how to build uh, huge vehicles in space uh, internationally through cooperation. We're also doing science in space. And of specific interest to me is the science we do um, to understand how the human body adapts to space and what we can do to help it to prevent muscle and bone atrophy, for example. Does the human body adapt satisfactorily in space, would you say? It does. Psychologically, you can adapt fairly quickly to space. One of the problems, you can, you can learn how to float around in just a few days and become comfortable at it. Um, physically, your body keeps adapting and some of the ways it adapts aren't all that beneficial. For example, you don't need very many muscles to move around in space. You can literally float. And that means your muscles atrophy. It's easy to get the muscles back. But when the bone doesn't get used, it atrophies too. You get bone loss. And that can be a much more serious problem. It can be irreversible after a while. Extraordinary. When you come back from space, how does it feel to be a mere earthling again? It, you feel very, very heavy. Do you? I, I, I found that I was very heavy, especially if I didn't stand up perfectly straight. Um, things seem to fall very, very quickly here on Earth. You get used to being able to place things in front of you and have them just stay there or float quietly away. But on Earth, if you put your car keys right in front of you, invariably they fall and hit the ground. And it's almost annoying at first. Um, it, it takes a while to get your land legs back when yeah. you come home. You have another space mission coming up. What mm -hmm. preparation is involved? There's a lot of preparation for every space shuttle flight. I'll be flying in a year's time on the space shuttle Endeavour on another construction mission to the International Space Station. And my colleagues and I will spend that entire year training for our various roles. Uh, some of us will be flying the shuttle, others will be operating the shuttle and station's robot arms, and another colleague and I will be doing the spacewalks. And so we will spend the bulk of this year training for those, both underwater and on dry land. Underwater, why would that be? Uh, it's a wonderful, if you, if you put on a spacesuit and it's weighted down just perfectly and then you get into the huge pool we have at NASA, you can actually float. You can be neutrally buoyant, neither rising to the surface nor sinking to the bottom of the pool. And that's very like being in space where you can move around with just a gentle handhold of the edge of the station. You can translate around the station and get to the various work sites and practice the various construction uh, activities. It really simulates weightlessness. It, it really does in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll be spending a lot of time doing that. We have three spacewalks and each of them will require half a dozen to a dozen training sessions in this pool. The scariest of all things are spacewalks. <laughs> I think the most exciting of all things actually yeah, yeah. too, yes. <laughs> So this is kind of a goodwill mission that you're on, isn't it? Coming to a school like this gives you a lot of pleasure, I trust. It, it does. It reminds me a lot of my school days back in England at the Harrow School in London. I see. It's wonderful to come here and it's, it's, it's really wonderful when you have a, a job like mine to be able to come and share it with other people. And very special when you get to share it with people in a wonderful faraway place like yes. Bangkok. <laughs> and at a school that after just a day and a half I already feel at home at, actually. Nicholas, being an astronaut will make you a person of interest, really, for the rest of your life, won't it? How do you cope with that? Well, it gives me a wonderful opportunity to discuss spaceflight, which I really enjoy discussing. And it's especially an opportunity to emphasize the importance of studying at school and the importance of studying sciences like physics and mathematics and engineering uh, to children who are going to make uh, very important decisions about what they do in life. Yeah. Space is just a wonderful vehicle for getting through to children. And do you let them know that you have a bit of fun up there too? We, we always do. I mean, so the, the fun is the thing that really catches their attention. When we play with water or spin things around in space and you can watch them float, that's really wonderful. But in each of those things, there's a physics lesson. <laughs> so here at Harrow, many people have delighted in meeting you. It's uh, terrific to come across a real live astronaut. <laughs> so we wish you very well for your upcoming mission, which is within the year, isn't it? That's right. Thank yeah. you very much. It's been really a wonderful uh, experience for me both to come to Bangkok and to visit the Harrow International School here, where I've had such a, a wonderful, warm and intelligent reception. <laughs>
So thank you so much, Nicholas. Well, yeah, that's terrific. Yeah, really good. Yeah. To view more of my videos or to contact me regarding your own projects, please visit my website rodmcneil.tv.